Oh, thanks very much. Great to be here. It's Arthur. I'm, I am Arthur McGregor. Uh, I'm the Canadian Vice President of Local 1000, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to pass this over to Eve, Eve Goldberg, who's going to do a statement about the land that we are on at the moment. Eve. Hi there, I'm Eve Goldberg, and um, I'm joining you, I don't know where you are, but I'm joining you from the traditional territories of the Mississauga of the Credit, uh, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, part of the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, otherwise known as Toronto. Um, and the Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississauga, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share this territory and protect the land. And since it came into effect, subsequent Indigenous nations and people from all over the world, settlers who have come here from all over the world, have been welcomed into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. So we give thanks for all the people who share this land and for the animals and plants that share it with us. And we hope we can come into balance um, with each other in a way that promotes harmony and right relationships. And I also wanted to acknowledge that tomorrow is the first uh, National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, and we're being asked to engage in some reflection on the deep damages done by the residential school system. So I hope that this is a small step towards righting some historical wrongs that affect us all. So I think I'll leave it there, but if anybody wants to put their, uh, the traditional territories they're coming from, uh, into the chat, we would welcome that. Okay, thank you very much, Eve. Appreciate it. Uh, now, I got to say, what would a discussion about music be without a song to start with? So, Ken. Uh, okay, Ken. well, in the spirit of what Eve just said, uh, I'm going to suggest that we lay down our sword and shield that we sort of turn our swords into plowshares as a as another uh, metaphor says you know we we uh we turn the uh you know the the cannons into banjos however that may transpire and uh and that kind of thing so uh i'm sure you all know this song gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside down by the riverside, way down by the riverside, gonna lay down my sword and shield. Tell me where. Oh, down by the riverside, I ain't gonna study a war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. Shake hands with everyone. I'm gonna shake hands with everyone. Tell me where? Down by the riverside. Oh, yeah. Tell me where? Down by the riverside. Gonna shake hands with everyone. Down by the riverside. Down by the riverside, I ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. I ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study war no more. Ain't gonna study. One no more, the one no more. And if you're wondering why other people muted themselves uh, at that moment, uh, much as you would have liked to have heard all and everyone singing along, that uh, of course Zoom is not quite caught up to simultaneous uh, broadcasts. So 
So uh, in the interests of um, synchronicity, we we just people had the Zoom chops together to uh, mute themselves when they weren't singing, or when they were singing, so it wasn't a cacophony. Thanks, Ken. That was great. Ah, uh, sang along. I'd like to thank FMO for hosting this panel and the Canadian Federation of Musicians for their sponsorship. Special thanks to Rosalind Dennett. Uh, Rosalind is a local 1000 member. She is a, an employee of the uh, Canadian uh, the CFM and she's a vice president of FMO. Wow. And she's a new mother. So thanks, Rosalind. You're a great, great. great. Uh, thanks, Ken. We've come to introduce, we're here to introduce and describe and discuss the idea of asking music venues across North America to commit to pay the musicians they hire a minimum wage for the work they do. Now, this seems like a no brainer to a music local, but as we will describe today, venues mostly played by members of the folk community tend to be small venues, often house concerts, coffee houses, churches, schools, venues that often offer a percentage of the door or a fee that adds to the unsustainable income for a performer. With the collapse of CD sales, the door income is vital to touring musicians and their ability to make a living playing music. Today with us are Eve Goldberg, former president of uh, CFM Local 1000, longtime activist for both labor and indigenous rights, and this year's recipient of the Stel Klein Award. Ken Whiteley, longtime Local 1000 member, one of Canada's folk music treasures, and Leonard Podolik, banjo player of renown and executive director of Home Roots, Canada's brilliant house concert touring program. Each of them will offer a description of their involvement with fair trade music and how it affects their dealings within the world of folk music. But first, I'd like to read a short description of the folk community in the 1960s when Estelle Klein was organizing the Mariposa Folk Festival in, on Toronto Islands. This was written just recently, uh, very timely as well, by Lee Klein, a close friend and co-worker of Estelle, if I may. I worked, with, I, I worked and was friends with Estelle Klein in a number of projects over many years, including being assistant artistic director and tech director of the 60s and 70s for the Mariposa Festival. During the 60s, there were issues between local musicians' union and the folk musicians' coffee houses about rates, because folk music being a new form neither side really understood the other. The union wanted the coffee houses unionized, but a lot of coffee houses couldn't afford the standard rate, and there was an issue of union members not being able to perform with non-union members. Estelle spearheaded, with the help of Klaus van Graft, and successfully helped create a special coffee house rate, which definitely helped the performers and was a fee that coffee houses could afford, and the union got new members. As well, Toronto's Riverboat Coffee House was dark on Monday nights, and came, they came up with the idea of holding a hoot nanny with mostly local musicians. She and the local created a hoot nanny rate. The deal was we had to hire three union musicians on contract each night for the grand sum of fifteen dollars each, and everybody else was union or not. Everybody else, union or not, was allowed to perform. It doesn't seem like a big deal now, but it was huge then. About Mariposa dropping the evening concerts and going to a daytime only multi-stage format, all three major festivals, Newport, Philly, and Mariposa, always had a few daytime workshops, but they were set aside for the evening concerts. One year at the Toronto Island, we had major gate crashing security issues, as did most, festival, most music festivals that year. Estelle came up with the radical idea of no massive evening concerts. The festival would end at 8 p.m., and there would be multiple daytime stages with workshops and concerts. As well, all performers, big names and small, would get the same minimal per diem, plus paid all travel expenses and hotel expenses. We all stayed at one hotel, and she thought that the performers would have time to interact privately and collaborate with one another without having to put on a show. It obviously worked, and the collaborations that came out of the, this idea were major. One of them was Ali Bain's Transatlantic, Transatlantic Centers Sessions. Pardon me. I barely read my own writing. Uh, Ooh, where are we? So Lee's letter goes on to describe Estelle's that quality of or that idea of equality and equal pay. So here we are 50 years later discussing the way to help folk musicians get fair income from the shows that, that, that are played. And there are three Estelle Klein recipients of this panel, Ken, Eve and myself. Leonard, you'll have to move to Ontario. Okay, that's the deal. 
to describe some of the local 1000 history and specifics of fair trade music, here's Eve Goldberg, past president of Local 1000, a wonderful musician, busy and sought after teacher, and this year's recipient of the Estelle Klein Award. Eve. Thanks, Arthur. So um, in my section of this panel, I, I'm going to talk just a little bit about what Local 1000 is and what fair trade music is. So Local 1000 is a local of the American Federation of Musicians, the Musicians Union, which um, exists all across North America. Um, we're a unique local because uh, members come from all over Canada and the United States. And um, normal before Local 1000 existed, if you wanted to become a member of the Musicians Union, you would join the local in your town. So if you lived in Toronto, you would join the Toronto local. If you lived in Winnipeg, you'd join the Winnipeg local and so on. But um, touring and folk, uh, touring folk and acoustic musicians found um, that they were hardly ever playing in their hometown. I mean, most of what we do is play in other places every night, and um, that we had more in common with each other than necessarily with um, you know some of the other musicians. Not that we don't have anything in common, but we have some unique issues, and so. Um, the local was formed to serve the needs of those touring acoustic uh, folk, uh, acoustic and folk musicians. Um, so, you know, when we're traveling, we have one office that we deal with. Uh, we can um, do all our sort of paperwork through all that office. And more importantly, um, we can work together on issues that are important to us. So that's kind of who Local 1000 is. We have um, several hundred members all across uh, Canada and the US. Um, and, um, you know, we sort of try to cater to the needs of folk and acoustic musicians. Um, and Fair Trade Music is a program that Local 1000 runs. Um, and it was an idea that originally came from the Portland local of the Musicians Union, actually. Um, and the idea of Fair Trade Music is kind of comparable to the idea of Fair Trade Coffee. You know, um, I think when fair, the idea of Fair Trade Coffee is, uh, and maybe other goods that you're used to as a consumer, um, you can buy your coffee or whatever other product it is, knowing that the people who grew the coffee, picked the coffee, uh, worked in the fields uh, and all that are being treated fairly. There's some minimum conditions. Um, and so the idea was, um, why not apply that to music? Uh, what if venues could be designated as a fair trade music venue? which would indicate that they've committed to some um, minimum standards for the treatment of musicians. And in the case of Local 1000, our program, some minimum wage um, agreements, you know, that are pretty uh, minimal. I'll say minimal is, is a good word for it. Sort of us up a, a, um, a bottom level, you know, it couldn't go higher than that, but, um, it, you know, an idea of a floor for for those kinds of things so as we educate audiences about the idea of fair trade music hopefully they would want to patronize a club or a concert series you know that they knew was treating the musicians fairly so that's kind of in a nutshell the idea of fair trade music so in terms of the venues what is the commitment um, it's not very onerous the main thing that the venue agrees to is to pay a minimum guarantee, which is uh, a, the according to the current wage scale set by AFM Local 1000, and I'll get back to that in a second, um, to pay musicians in a timely fashion to um, as a venue to um, sort of limit the number of open mics where no one's paid versus the number of, of um, paid concerts um where you're hiring musicians and paying them a fee and um to be willing to sign a union contract if a musician asks for it you don't have to sign it's not that you're agreeing to sign a union contract for every single gig but if the musician wants that that you're willing to do that um and to let musicians know when they're hired to perform at your venue that you're a fair trade music venue and to provide each musician with the information about what that means and the information about Local 1000. Um, so getting back to this idea of minimum scales, um, just to give you some sense, um, Local 1000 sets scales that are used for um, when musicians sign contracts. So a venue 
um, that agrees to be a fair trade music venue agrees to to at least offer those minimum amounts to musicians when they play there. So for a small concert, that would be $120 for a solo musician. Um, for an opening act, it would be $75. Um, for a large concert, it would be $250 for a solo musician. And for ensembles, there's a little formula where you add an additional half of the solo scale amount for each additional musician. So for example, a duo would end up being 375 a trio would end up being $500 and so on. And the only other um, financial obligation is if you agree to sign, if the musician asks for a union contract, um, that you would agree to sp pay a small amount that would go towards the pension contribution that's part of that contract. So for a small venue, it works out to about 10 to $15 more than that minimum that we're talking about. Um, so that's kind of the the uh, criteria for being a uh, fair trade music venue that you agree to to these principles and um, that you're able to carry through on them. Um, so why do it is the question. And, um, you know, I think the first thing I would say is it's the right thing to do. It shows a, a commitment to musicians and to fairness, um, and it shows other people that you're um, committed to treating the musicians you hire fairly. Um, it demonstrates to musicians that your venue is a good place to play because you're you're going to abide by some minimum standards, and it also educates your audience about the fair treatment of musician and musicians, and it sort of spreads that idea around, uh, which I think is something that we want to promote to as a community be thinking about that everybody's getting treated fairly and no one's. Uh, being exploited or coming away from something uh, without fair compensation or fair working conditions. So, so that's kind of the fair trade music program in a nutshell. Um, I think others are going to sort of uh, offer their perspectives on the idea and their experience with it and so on. So I will pass things over to Ken, I think is going to do the next little part. Am I right? Yeah, Ken is. Yeah, I just wanted to introduce Ken. No, I funny it's i'm just gonna say ken doesn't need any introduction <laughs> <laughs> my kids grew up listening to junior jug band and i used to sing my heart out at the gospels mornings at uh, blue skies so uh, uh thanks for that ken uh, and here we are sharing a uh, a discussion so tell me your views on fair trade well it's it's kind of interesting because i was also mentored by estelle i was one of the recipients of some of those $15. And in fact, when our five piece jug band used to play some of those hoot nannies at the riverboat, and we were the featured artist, we would actually all get $15. So we would actually make, you know, uh, $60 for all, all of us, uh, you know, but, but I was, you know, I was in high school. So it was, that was cool, you know, and in the sixties, $15 went a lot further, you know, um, but but the I you know and that's really where I was introduced to this idea that uh, being a union member could be beneficial, and um, our in fact our very first gig was at the Bohemian Embassy Coffee House, which was on like three floors up, it, it on this little side alley off Wellesley Street. Uh, that Don Cullen used to run, and we signed a union contract for that gig, and and it was at that coffee house scale, you know. So so uh, you know I can't remember exactly, you know. So thirty, I remember running a coffee house in the in the seventies, and at that point, coffee house scale was thirty dollars. And had there been a fair trade music at that time, I would have been happy to have signed uh, a you know a fair trade agreement because. That was sort of the bottom line. If you couldn't, if you couldn't pay the artist thirty bucks, it's or if you're a house concert now and you can't pay the art, you know, you're not going to get enough people at your house concert to pay them one hundred and twenty-five bucks. Like maybe you shouldn't be doing that house concert. I mean, now there's exceptions to that, and I've done home roots uh, tours, you know, and some had some very memorable occasions where there were, but there were only seven paying people in the in the house. 
that still probably comes to about 150 bucks. I get, I would, I would guess, you know, I, I, anyway, whatever. But, um, so for me, it's, you know, union membership has been a, a life long, uh, thing. And we quickly learned that, okay, yeah, the coffee house, you know, the sort of minimum as, as Eve described it, the floor was great, but it was really great when we got to do a TV show. And then we were paid at, at, a, at a much higher scale. And, and then if they replayed that TV show, we got money again. And, you know, I mean, I think back to, um, uh, you know, a song that Mo Scarlett, Jackie Washington and I had recorded, and we had filed an AFFM, AFFM recording contract for the recording. And, uh, 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 you know, coffee company in Europe wanted to use one of the, our songs on their ads for, for you know, for their new uh, coffee machine. And um, so we all, and including, you know, George Kohler, the bass player, we all got an upgrade to our AF of M payment before, as well as the sort of the buyout for that, for that sync license. And, um, you know, so, so again, once again, and, and now I'm in the position where, um, you know, I'm 70 years old and I'm taking, uh, the benefit of, of a musician's union pension. And when I joined local 1000, it was like a light bulb. I mean, I'd been a union member for, you know, uh, over, I guess, yeah, 30 years at that point. And, um, you know, but the idea of taking a contract to a house concert, you know, and, and, and some house concerts, there have been some house concert series that are willing to join fair trade music. And that's really great. But even the ones that won't, you can say, look, I'm going to bring a union contract and at the end of the night, you just sign it over and say, yes, you know, I got $425. And that's what we'll put down on the contract for what I'm receiving. And you, you don't have to worry about it. But I could then say that, you know, 250 was scale wages and $25 was a pension contribution. And so, you know, in in those, um, you know, once I twigged to the fact that it was actually much to my benefit to continue filing, not just recording contracts, but also for all, all my gigs, as, as my, many as I could, it really helped me basically up my pension contribution. So, um, so now at the age of 70, every year I get, I mean, every month I get, uh, you know, 900 bucks deposited in my bank account. It's not going to make me rich. I'm not going to retire, but, but Hey, what folk musician would, would, would say, you know, they couldn't use an extra 900 bucks every month. And, uh, you know, and of course the amounts will vary depending on how much you use that. But, but just to say that um, I feel so fortunate that I kind of bought in, if you will, and I wish that I had twigged to it sooner. You know, I mean, I was aware that I was getting pension on, you know, TV shows and things like that. But, but uh, you know, had I, and really Local 1000 facilitated that because until then, if you filed a union contract, say I've been a local 149, a Toronto Musicians Association member for 55 years now. But if if um, if as a local 149 member, if I play in Regina and Saskatoon and Calgary and Edmonton, and you know, I and if I want to file a contract as a 149 member, I have to file all of those contracts with all of the locals in all of those jurisdictions. Whereas a one as a 1,000 member, it's actually part of the whole AFM CFM uh, bylaws that you can just file all of those traveling contracts with local 1,000. So it makes the paperwork way easier and the whole process easier and the whole understanding of, you know, because some locals don't like it when you file a contract the day after the show, as opposed to, 
you know, you're supposed to, you know, they want you to follow it ahead of the show and things like that. So anyway, there's a, a lot of those flexibilities that are built into Local 1000 have been really uh, a great thing. And is, is that enough of my, I've probably talked too much already. So I'll, oh, you, you never talk too much, Ken, never, ever. I often talk too much, but that's beside <laughs> the point. You know, one of the things uh, back in, in the day, I have, there's a poster right, uh, actually right there of Sneezy Waters at, uh, playing at Roosters. I started Roosters Coffee House back in the 70s. And uh, back then you'd hire somebody for three to four nights. Uh, so not only would they get an amount for one night, but they'd be able to build an audience over over a period. And I got to say, that's one thing that's really missing now is, is the ability to build an audience in a, in a location. House concert tours uh, allow musicians to get regular income, but they don't allow you to build an audience in a, in a location. Uh, which means that you could go back there and everybody would line up for you. Of course, we all line up for Ken. Sure. Thank you, Ken. That was uh, great stuff. Uh, so uh, next we have Leonard. Uh, Leonard Pedalik is the executive director of Home Roots, Canada's excellent concert musicians employment center. <laughs> A Winnipeg-based nonprofit organization, Home Roots, Shaman Shainu, was initiated by the founders of the Winnipeg Folk Festival and the West End Cultural Center in Winnipeg, Mitch Bedalek and Ava Kabrinsky, alongside Tim Osmond with a startup grant from Canada Council for the Arts. Uh, Leonard, you've been doing this for a while now, and I see uh, uh, home roots, especially during the pandemic, you've really expanded into a lot of uh, innovative programs. Uh, the Cranky Festival uh, is one of the things that uh, really turns my crank, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, it's it's great to be here, and thanks so much for for including me in in this panel. Um, yeah, I think uh, with the pandemic, it, it really it, it sort of it drove home that uh, a few different things. One is how vulnerable um, musicians are. Before I was a, a music executive <laughs> or a folk music administrator, really is what I am. Um, uh, you know, I was on the road for, for many years and, and, uh, you know, we, we musicians get into it, especially folk musicians, because they, they love the art and they love the craft and they love who's inspired them. And, and when the scene really lifts people up, it's the most beautiful thing that you can possibly imagine. But, uh, you balance that with the, the reality of fitting that into, you know, our society and a pandemic happens and we see how vulnerable musicians are uh, and the whole scene in general. And if Home Roots wanted to continue, um, well, just backing up uh, for many years, for 14 years, uh, what Home Roots did was to um, recruit people out of the woodwork, movers and shakers in rural communities, not people who had been hosting house concerts for a very long time uh, and who fancied themselves presenters and who were knowledgeable about folk music. It was more about building a new infrastructure in addition to the folk music infrastructure that already existed and, and building a network that would give artists the possibility of, of you know, having a, a big hub of gigs in a region that could be built around. And, and so literally for the first few years, folks were in the office, um, we're calling up librarians and you know museum curators and anyone from the from you know the community. Who do you know? Who's who's cool? Who likes to make things happen in town? And then we'd give them a call, or or they would give them a call. It was before I was a part of the team, um, and and they would connect uh, twelve or thirteen of these these host volunteer presenters in a region of Canada and schedule an artist to play all 13 of these places in a two week period. And while that was happening, the same thing was happening across the country uh, in as many as up to 16 other tours across across Canada. And, um, you know, it, it, it had some amazing elements to it, you know, just the community factor and, and the idea of connecting small community concerts uh, that artists don't have to, you know, you know, the, the load in is bring your instruments to the living room and the, the hotel is bring your suitcases to the bedroom. And, and, you know, the, oh, do we have time to, you know, there's time to eat dinner, all those things. It takes out a lot of the stresses of the usual um, touring experience. 
however, you know, like like Ken alluded to the the you know, you never knew it was going to happen and you might have the, the most amazing show with 45 people in a big mansion one night and then, you know, play, uh, you got, you became, uh, you know, the entertainment for the kid's birthday party that you were told it was a matinee and there was five paying adults and 20 kids. And then the second you finish, they pull out the saxophones and play somewhere really far over the rainbow, you know, and, uh, you know, and it's pretty fun, weird, you know, it was a little bit inconsistent and um with the pandemic i think it's really brought into to focus uh what our role really is and and what we consider our role to be we were always trying to support artists expanding on infrastructure but uh with the pandemic you know we started we immediately had to cancel 80 artists just like that overnight. But instead of just canceling them, we said, hey, you know what? We have a Facebook page, want to log in? And we scheduled them all to play on, on, on Facebook Live. And it was, it, was, it was sort of what we could do as an instant reaction without having to figure it out. But while that was happening, we figured it out and we, we built a ticketing system and, and, and we started creating really cool shows with artists in different places using Zoom. Um, but the point is, is that we did what we had to do to make the best possible situation to still continue to, to pay artists. And so what happened was, you know, with with one artist who was his first show in a while, you know, we sold 500 tickets and sent him the same amount of money that he likely would have made on a home roots tour as it was in the past. So we saw what the potential of the Internet was and. And now we see ourselves as an art artist. Um, it's hard to describe what we see ourselves, but the experience of being on Home Roots is going to be much different. There's going to be a much bigger connection between all the hosts and each other, between the hosts and us, what we can do for artists during the year, even when they're not implicated with us and how we can lift and share their stuff. And so um, that's why with Fair Trade Music, tying it all in, is it is it really... You know, in, in the past, and, and I hope this was your experience, Ken, I'm not sure, uh, the, the, the contracts that we did use was based on the local 1000 contract. And uh, we would either guarantee the minimum or, uh, you know, if, if it didn't work out, we'd pay for hotels or if a show got canceled. And, but, but now we're looking at it far beyond, you know, what is the minimum we're doing? What is the maximum? And I think with fair trade music, it, just like Eve said, it, it gives the impression to everybody and to us on staff, um, in some ways, the most importantly, that, that we are here. The reason why we exist as an organization is because of folk musicians and not the other way around. You know, our job is to, our job is to lift up musicians and we are lucky to, to have, to be able to squeak out a living <laughs> doing you know putting these things together but it's gotten more and more dynamic and more and more interesting and and you know uh the the palettes the the platforms that we have now you know uh, one of the things i was thinking about is imagine if it was an obligation of, of presenters who have live venues to also make an online option one of the things that we found is that you know we're, we're getting emails from people going, I'm gee whiz, I'm, I sure hope that after the pandemic, uh, you still continue to do these online shows because, um, well, even if COVID-19 goes away, my glaucoma is still going to be here. And, you're, you know, I, I can't drive at nighttime anymore, or I can't do this. And it's hard for me. I'm in a wheelchair. There's lots of reasons why people can't just get up and go to a show like they want to. And so, you know, and so for artists, uh, the online thing is yet another income stream that that shows can become a bit more dynamic there's the live audience and there's the online audience and and so even though typically our setup is not rooted in artist guarantees um it's just a philosophy to do as much as we can that's been developed to do as much as we can to lift the artists to lift the shows to to uh, you know to make it so that they're walking out with way way above what the minimum standard is. And, and we feel confident um, that, that it's really, you know, it, it, 
we're at the beginning of something here and we're very excited to get on board with it. Is that good? <laughs> uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> Thanks so much, Leonard. That was really cool. Uh, you know, it's, it's such a, a wonder to, to, to be part of Home Roots. Uh, we have been a part of Home Roots, my wife and I, and I know that uh, Eve and Ken have also been a part of Home Roots. And uh, without Home Roots, uh, Canada would be a different place. And I'll tell you, a lot of our American compatriots are really jealous of Home Roots, I'll tell you. Uh, well, it, it's a work in progress. And, and um, yeah, where, where we're going is to try to figure you know, we realized, you know, there's, we're putting these artists on the tour for two weeks. And, and now the online thing is such a big deal. It's a what an opportunity to, for something to build around as far as artists experience and about our engagement with them and about what it can be. It's a great, you know, when you're, you touring Canada is, is interesting because most of the times when you tour, you're doing this long linear stretch and there's five or six hours between gigs in a lot of cases. And so it's neat to really hone in on one region of Canada and be able to do these few gigs. But now we're starting to look at how we can create content along the way with the artists and have places to disseminate them after the tour behind a paywall, creating passive income with a plan to do another online show that's geared to those, those markets that they played at and, and also um, the general greater ether out there, you know, people out there. Um, but, but I think, you know, and we're partnering with side door who are the other, the other house concert folks who've really organized, they pivoted big time to, um, to make their platform suitable for online shows. And, and we're, we realized that, you know, we could spend a lot of money in applying grants and time on this to develop this technology. They've already done that. You know, they've developed this really great system. We're curators. We have a different sort of network. They have a different sort of network together when it comes to the online shows and the, and, and the, the house concerts, we think we can really build a, a profound experience for artists post pandemic. Cross our fingers by next fall. Amen to that. Ken or Eve, do you have any questions for Leonard or any comments about uh, anybody? I mean, I think uh, to me, what Leonard's talking about is really, um, I'm sure it's the reason most people get into presenting concerts in the folk world is like because you love the music and you want to support the musicians and um you know i think um being able to kind of commit to sort of like fair treatment to put it into that context um and understand you know what uh, that this is a job for musicians and they need to come away sort of with some minimum minimum income and know that there's going to be uh you know a place for them to warm up or whatever like just the those things that make uh putting on a concert possible um i think uh you know so i i have a lot of respect for venues that you know put themselves out there and just say yep we're we're here we want to treat the musicians fairly and this is how we're doing it and i think fair trade music is a great way to do that you know to just be able to say we're a fair trade music venue so well, you know. I, just reacting to what you just said about you know having a place to a place to warm up and all that you know with with the ducks uh when we started touring in the states um you know i grew up uh giving up my bed for for folk musicians my entire childhood starting from you know the time i was very young um but when i went i started touring and you know we'd be doing the sound check and i'd meet the promoter and this and that we'd talk about it and, and it just happened to say like what what so uh, where are we staying what's going on and this is obviously a long time ago and i was pretty young and green and naive and and the the presenter would look at me and go what do you mean yeah we're we're here we're doing the gig is there a hotel are we staying at somebody's house or how does it what's going on and, and they'd be like well I, I have no idea where you booked yourself <laughs> and and it was just a, a, a different headspace that i wasn't a party to like i i didn't realize that that's that's what it was you know and if you're gonna to, to us if you're bringing an artist into your town to do a special show 
you know, that, that he, I had just assumed that that was a part of it, you know? And um, so, you know, it's a dynamic, it's a dynamic thing as we, as we go forward. I think, you know, I think there's, there's a volition among presenters and among artists and all the stakeholders actually to, to work a little bit more closely together and, and collaborate and be less about our own territory and, and about how actually, if we do work together collaboratively, we can make the most successful situations for everybody involved instead of beating each other up and using the same old models. Yeah. And that's a great, that story is of course a great illustration of why communication is so important and why you need to ask the questions before you get to Minneapolis or wherever yeah. you are. And, uh, you know, what, so what, you, I was you supposed know, to bring the PA. <laughs> yeah. There's a whole skill set involved in that. And, and like all aspects of this and, and theoretically as folk musicians, we should be about communicating. And, and so it really, fair trade music is one way to communicate in a whole package, a bunch of principles. Uh, but, but as you illustrate, Leonard, it's just like, it is about communication so that, you know, you, somebody in your group, in your party, whether that's you as your group, your party, your people yeah. is you, yeah. or or there is a bunch of people sharing some responsibilities. You've you've asked the questions ahead of time, you you know, and you plan accordingly. You you try and deal with this accordingly, and and that's so communication. You know, one of the the things that a lot of people, not a lot of people, that people do ask is why is uh, uh, fair trade music specific to folk music and uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, and and Leonard went through some. We've all gone through some of the reasons, but but there are uh, other uh, styles of music, rock music, jazz, and their focus is on parking spots in downtown or or how far they have to walk to their apartment or their their hotel, that kind of thing. Their their priorities are totally different from our priorities. One of the things is that if uh, if you live in Ottawa and your first gig is in Winnipeg, you have two days of two, two days of driving before you get paid. Uh, so there's a, a real difference in, in, in that aspect of it. Yeah, and I'll just chime in and say Local 1000 is not the only local of the AFM that has a fair trade music program, and that's, I, that's what Arthur's referring to. So there's a program in Seattle, there's one in Portland, uh, I think there's one now in Atlanta, um, and a couple of other locals are sort of developing them. And really, they, the idea is for the musicians, it's kind of to bring musicians together who may or may not already be union members, but to bring them together to say, what are the issues that are what are the barriers and what are the issues that are facing you so for instance in Seattle they met with these young musicians you know um, teenagers and people in their young 20s who are playing in all these uh, clubs in downtown Seattle and as Arthur said all different styles of music so rock and punk and and metal or whatever and and they asked them like what are the things what are the problems you have when you go to pay gigs play gigs in these clubs and it turned out um that it was things like being able to unload in front of the venue without getting a ticket, um, having a dedicated sound person, um, being doing the payment reconciliation transparently right after, um, and things like that. And, and their programs actually aren't concerned with minimum wages uh, at all. There's, they're concerned with it, these kinds of working conditions for for these young musicians who are playing these clubs. Um, so Local 1000 is the only fair trade music program in the AFM that includes that bit about minimum standards. And I think that reflects our, the way that our music scene works and the concerns of the musicians who are, who are playing these concerts. So, um, but as a concept, I think, uh, you know, it's sort of about the musicians getting together and talking about with each other, what are the minimum things that we need? And, uh, and, and sort of uh, bringing that to the venues. And in Seattle, they've had huge success with um, signing venues on and, and a real, um, a lot of now, a lot of um, public 
understanding of this idea of fair trade music and which clubs are adhering to these to the their standards for fair trade music so and Paul asked a question and I, I don't know if, if uh, Leonard wants to ask uh, Paul Mills asked uh, you know how how does uh, home roots in the home roots context the audience is too small to meet the minimum pay who picks who picks up the difference well that's and never going to be the situation again <laughs> well, I know, I know, I know, I'm just, just, but I know, I know, you know, Ava said to me, she said, you know, kind of what I asked about <coughs> minimum scales, you know, for one of my early home roots tours. And she said, I can't guarantee that every venue is going to meet scale, but I can guarantee that over the 13 shows, you will meet get guaranteed scale for uh, averaging it out. So, yeah, as a as a minimum, you know, and obviously you can probably expect to do a lot better than that. But 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 yes, I can guarantee that. So I can't guarantee on a night by night basis. But anyway, that's how that was dealt with at that time. But Leonard, you have the latest. Yeah, here. I, I would. Um, I would One of the things that I think is very important about why I think, you know, in my right mind would be happy to sign on to fair trade music. It's not just about the guarantee. It's about um, maybe spending more time uh, as an organization. Like what's gonna happen right now is we're, re we're gonna rebuild the tours. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna redesign the tours. And in that process, you know, I think if, if over the, the 13 gigs, um, we didn't meet that average. Um, it would be incumbent upon the organization to 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 top it up, and not the original, not the house concert hosts per se. However, that said, I think you know one of one of the you know a lot of us don't appreciate our worth. You know what I mean, artists and and arts administrators. And sometimes we sort of, you know, you know, maybe it's because we were always, you know, counting on, uh, you know, we're always asking for money. We're always asking for grants, this and that, I don't know, whatever. Um, but sometimes I think we, we tend to undervalue ourselves. And, and one of the, the things that I think might have existed in the past was that we thought that the hosts were doing us a favor a little bit. And, and I think uh, the hosts definitely contribute a massive part of the experience of what it is uh, of the home roots experience for artists and for our existence as an organization. You know what I mean? Without the hosts, without the artists, we're not an organization, you know, while at the same time, I don't think that they're doing us a favor. I, I think they're doing it because they want to do it. And I think they want to do it for a few really great reasons. One is they want to move and shake in their community. They want to uh, invite people to their in their world. They want to host. They want to do all those things. And as time has gone on, it's become more important. They want to meet the artists. They want to hang out with artists. Artists are people of the world. They travel the world and they have all these stories and they live a different lifestyle than the people in Lacombe, Alberta. You, you know, and 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 they want to, you know, there's a there's an experience there. So I think it's also incumbent upon us as an organization to, to say to the hosts, which is what's going to be happening, you know, on a, on a profound level, which is that artists are on tour. Artists go on tour to make money. They make money so that they can make a living and just like anybody else. So these shows, you know, it's not about just you and your friends. We're going to be asking them. We're going to be negotiating a certain amount of tickets for the general public that will be available to all the to all the shows if if they have if they're really successful we're going to get we're going to ask them to go into a bigger venue and then we're going to come up with a amount of money that we're willing to spend on rent and venue expenses and we're going to partner with more more other arts presenting organizations and when we can partner up and make an artist uh go on on both networks you know the manitoba arts network and home roots well then there's 25 gigs in manitoba and if there's two two gigs in the same town, well, maybe the Home Roots host can host the after party and get free tickets to the 
their gig. You know, like there's, there's, we have to be creative in how we, how we do it. But, but as far as, you know, who's going to top up the, the minimum, I think it's, it's, it's going to be us, but it's also going to be asking the hosts to really take seriously the fact that artists are making a living and it's not just for them and their friends. Yeah, and uh, I'd like to chime in here because when you think about it, as for a solo artist, that hundred and twenty dollars, you know, if it let's say you're a house concert host who's not associated with Home Roots, you're just doing it yourself and and you know putting on a concert, um, you know, and hundred and twenty dollars would be the minimum. Well, if people are paying twenty bucks for a ticket, that's six people, you know. Um, if you th people are paying fifteen bucks for a ticket, that's eight people. So, you know, it's not a, it's not a, a outrageous um, request or an outrageous minimum. And I think if you do love the music and if you do care about the musicians and you want to help support the musicians, you should be willing to, 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 you know, to be able to meet that minimum. And, and I think for an independent house concert host, you know, let's say you only get five people paying 20 bucks and you're 20 bucks short. I, I do think that in that case, yeah, I, in my opinion, the house concert host should fork out that 20 bucks in that situation. Um, because I feel like as a host who offered to put on a concert, you know, um, they should be willing to take on that minimum level of responsibility to bring in the audience. So, um, and that's not to be yeah. negative about it. It's, you know, we all want to have a good time and we all want to have a good experience. It's, it's but to be realistic about what what you're commit what you're doing and what what is going to be the experience for the musician it, it goes back to the fact that as you know both of you have said today you know that that we are professional artists that this is what we do for a living and you know there's you know like if your plumber comes you're you're in for you know 80 bucks for him just showing up you know, and, and then if he does work, it's even more, you know, and so we're not really, it's not a big ask. No. And, uh, yeah. One of the, just to, to give an idea, uh, there's a, uh, we have, you know, six or seven pages of, of information on fair trade music. Uh, uh, and one of them is just our kind of frequently asked questions. And uh, just to go quickly over what the agreement actually agrees to, uh, it's the, there is the venue, of course, the, the artist agrees to show up and put on a great show, a professional show. Uh, the venue agrees to pay a minimum guarantee according to the current wage scales set by Local 1000. Musicians will be paid in a timely fashion. Language allowing the use of, uh, language allowing and limiting the use of open mics. Uh, the use of the fair trade music logo. Now the logo is one of the things, I mean, logos are, are you know, a bit uh, kitschy, if you will. But uh, they do tie things together, and uh, the fair trade logo uh, is something that would be nice to see in, in as many venues and uh, on as many guitar cases or fiddle cases as possible as well. Uh, the venue will notify musicians that their venue is fair trade. The venue will notify musicians that their venue is fair trade venue and provide each artist with the contact contact information of local 1000. The venue will sign an LS1 for US artists or an LPCC for Canadian artists contract if the artist so desires. Uh, and that point pertains to AFM members only. Now, uh, part of fair trade music is that uh, you don't have to be a union member to be part of fair trade music to take advantage of the promotion uh, of the, the support of fair trade music. So it really is a uh, uh, an open situation for all artists and all venues uh, that really want to see uh, the whole thing come together. I mean, uh, Leonard's talking about uh, uh, communication. Uh, Ken and Eve are also talking about communication of how get, uh, one of the ways to, to get communication is to have a common communication thing. Fair trade music can, can be that. <laughs> Excuse my great discussion points here. Uh, fair trade music could do that. Uh, so, oh, there's uh, there's three. Any other questions on the chat? Uh, well, and there's also no limit to which direction this could go. Like this is the angle that it's taking right now, right? But I'm I'm thinking about about you know how how can it become easier uh, for for Canadian musicians to get into the United States? Just as an example, 
you know, and, 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 and how fair trade music can be a uniting force to, to actually make that happen. Anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's yeah, the, and of course that the the problem there is that you know even with all of the unions and you know the the ACRA and all the different um, performing unions working together, it's very hard to move the U.S. government, which is what what we're dealing with. That's that's putting up the roadblocks in terms of costs, processing times, and so on. And but having said that, at least as a you know as a with AF of M agreements, you are in a better position to be able to get uh, a work visa to play in the States. Absolutely. And then Local 1000, our American uh, members are writing to their government to, to try and get uh, what one of the unfortunate things that happened is that when the pandemic happened, people who had uh, visas to get into the States, those visas were canceled, obviously, because the border was closed. And the government is not uh, honoring those visas to expand to extend them. Uh, they last for a year. The pandemic's lasted about two years now. So uh, they're essentially saying, "Folks, you're out of luck." So uh, thanks for the four grand. Yeah, really, exactly. So our American uh, members are writing to their contact people or their government uh, to see if something can happen about this. Uh, so, any other questions? Any other comments? Uh, if there's anybody listening to this and would like to get uh, information on fair trade, uh, the Local 1000 website, uh, uh, local1000.org. I just, uh, Arthur, I just put the page on fair trade music Perfect. into the chat so people Excellent. can just click on that link. Excellent. So there it is. So uh, that's it. Any, <laughs> any other comments? This has been great. This is this is exactly the, the thing that I wanted to happen here. And thank you so much, uh, the three of you, for, for getting involved in this. Uh, I honestly believe that fair trade music is is something that will catch on. And uh, uh, as soon as I get the sticker, it'll go on my guitar case, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And thanks so much to uh, all the folks at, at FMO for putting oh. on this conference. Yeah. In these difficult times, and and to Rosalind and all the work she's doing at CFM, it's great to have a folky embedded in in the you know I was watch you know I was looking at the um, uh, you know there was a, a you know one of the conference workshops on you know increasing the participation of of uh, black artists in the folk music community and and uh, one of the highlighted pieces of information is, you know, how do you get people, you know, embedded in the structures that that are, you know, running the bigger picture and 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 that's, a, you know, a bigger kind of question. But but uh, at least at least for us folkies, we do have Rosalind in the uh, in the CFM office and think that's a good thing. That's it. Thanks very much, folks. Thank you all, folks. Thank you, Arthur, for wrangling us. Been a pleasure. Take care. Cheers, y'all. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Well, I'm sending thanks to you.